Hello, everyone, again. Thanks for joining today's webinar. Uh, this is a webinar in the series of antimicrobial resistance mitigation. First of all, I want to say a quick word about the translation. If you want to hear this webinar in Spanish, please click on the globe that is probably at the bottom of your screen and enable the translation. I am Marisabel Caballero. I am your host today, and I work as Global Technical Manager for Poultry with EW Nutrition. Today is my greatest pleasure to introduce our two exceptional speakers. First, we have Dr. Heike Bigmore. She's a reputed veterinarian with long-standing credentials in some of the biggest companies in the industry. For example, Intervet, Loman, Pfizer, Siva, and now with Vaccinova. Her work in the poultry vaccine industry, both in Germany and abroad, make her one of the most informed and knowledgeable speakers in the industry. In summary, we can expect that our second presentation with Heike will have a very high level of practical solution-oriented expertise. Heike. Thank you very much for the warm welcome, and I'm looking forward to giving to you my thoughts. In charge of our first presentation, we have Dr. Tuan Van Gerber. Tuan is a veterinarian. He graduated from Utrecht University in 2000, and after working as field vet for a while, he rejoined Utrecht University to start a PhD project and also to teach poultry health. From 2009 to 2017, Tuan worked in different R&D positions with a two multinational nutrition companies. Since 2013, he is also a diplomat of the European College of Poultry Veterinary Science and works as, actually as technical director with EW Nutrition. He is today our first speaker, bringing up us insights about transmission of antimicrobial resistance. Tuan. Yes, uh, thank you for the elaborate introduction, Isabel. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this webinar and um, I thank all the participants for joining today. As usual, in our webinars, your questions are very welcome and they can be asked through the webinar in the Q&A panel that uh, you will see at the bottom of your screen. Some of your questions will receive instant replies and some of them will be picked up and answered in the live discussion that will follow the presentation. And now let's go to Tuan's uh, presentation. Please, uh, Dr. Van Gerber. Yes, let me share my presentation here and Yes, um, well, the, the title of my presentation is Transmission of um, Antimicrobial Resistance. Um, I'll be talking about the reduced use of critically important antibiotics in the industry. And then I'll continue with um, the main part of the presentation, which is on the epidemiology of antibiotic resistance. Then I'll talk about current and future diagnostic technologies to quantify AMR. And then I'll come to some conclusions on transmission and AMR mitigation. So when we talk about antibiotic reduction in animal production, globally, the focus is on reducing the use of antibiotics that the WHO identifies as critically important for the care of human patients. So this slide shows examples of reduced use in the USA, in, um, in, in the UK, and in China. So in the US, Tyson Foods reported that in 2019, 97% of their products were raised without these critically important antibiotics. In the UK, the poultry industry reduced its use by 97% over the course of a seven years period. And in the graph here on the right, it shows how the ban on the use of colistin in China, uh, the, the use of colistin in, in, in feed additives, huh? 
more specifically, how that significantly reduced the occurrence of E. coli bacteria that are resistant to colistin in swine, in poultry, but also in hospital patients. So antibiotic-free programs like the non-antibiotic ever production systems in the USA might also exclude the use of antibiotics in breeders. But, but should we be concerned about the use of critically important antibiotics in breeders? Now, historically, we have been mostly concerned about vertical transmission of pathogens causing disease in these animals. So the more the severe the disease, the more attention it got, which has resulted in successful eradication of pylorum disease and foul typh typhoid in many regions. Mycoplasma has been shown to be more challenging and continues to receive a lot of attention. In the recent decades, increased focus has been oriented on zoonotic infections with firstly the vertically transmittable salmonella and more recently the attention to specific types of antibiotic resistance genes, presumably transmittable vertically through the production chain. But the, the question is, is if in the future attention to the carrots of antibiotic resistance genes in parent stock will increase. And more importantly, how it will contribute to reduced carriage of resistance in food producing animals. So low level of um, resistance bacteria can exist in the microbiome. The chance of transmission of these resistance bacteria increases through antibiotic treatment that favors the growth of the bacteria carrying resistance genes. So as multi-resistant bacteria carry multiple resistance genes, the application of an antibiotic, which is not necessarily belonging to the group of critically important antibiotics, can still provoke a competitive advantage to antimicrobial resistance genes that are present on the same plasmid, including genes that are coding for resistance against critically important antibiotics. Does this mean that resistance is always passed on to the offspring? No, it, it doesn't. I mean, as indicated by the different colors of the arrows here, transmission routes that have been identified in research, and I will talk about these, are far more variable and definitely not limited to the trans ovarian route through which diseases of early concern like pylorum and plasma are known to transmit. So when reviewing the epidemiology of antimicrobial resistance, the first and most evident transmission route is horizontal spread of resistant bacteria within a flock, so between birds with direct contact. Resistant bacteria are known to spread rapidly within a broiler house. And as we have all become familiar with the basic reproduction number R0, I refer here to a study from 2016 in which the R0 was quantified for ESBL, uh, ESBL transmission in broilers. So it shows that the rate of spread is high in young flocks with a non-matured microbiome. And although the numbers of broilers carrying the bacteria with these genes can be low initially, over time, carriage of resistance E. coli increases and can reach 100% within flock prevalence around five weeks of age. Now, applying therapeutic antibiotics and broiler is a common practice, particularly prophylactic use in the first week of life. The competitive advantage the treatment gives to resistant bacteria will facilitate early colonization and transmission of these bacteria in that unmatured gut. While there are also indications that the same antibiotics influences microbiota diversity, which can further enhance the establishment of resistant bacteria in the broiler's microbiome. Horizontal transmission between flocks can occur in many ways. On the left, we see examples of transmission between different farms, while on the right, different transmission routes within a farm are, are displayed. So starting at the left top, um, transmission of bacteria and thereby AMR genes 
can occur between any farm type, like the two examples of breeder to breeder farm or broiler to broiler farm transmission. Different factors like vehicles and personnel moving between farms might be involved in the transmission. Transmission can also occur between farms housing different animal species, like the study of Jones from 2016 illustrates. They showed a 2.6 fold higher probability of detecting extended spectrum cephalosporine resistant E. coli when neighbors would grow pigs. So then, the within house transmission. Dependent on the level of internal biosecurity measures, house to house transmission of resistant bacteria is more or less likely to occur. Cycle to cycle transmission or within house persistence of, of, of bacteria is also an important route of horizontal transmission. Mo and others studied cephalosporine resistant E. coli persistence and found that 12, a 12.7 12 uh, higher chance of detecting it when the previous flock was also positive for these bacteria and, and uh, resistance genes. So fortunately, there is uh, also a, a, a quantified effect of proper disinfection. And we see here that it can effectively reduce the risk of persistency by as much as 90%. Transmission through the vertically designed production chain with centrally the hatchery is often referred to as vertical transmission. The hatchery has a central place, but the vector through which the bacteria can spread is not limited to the obvious subject, sub suspect, the hatching egg. Um, other vectors might play a role too. Yeah. We should differentiate here between truly vertical transmission and apparent or semi-vertical transmission. Pathogens that are capable to contaminate the internal egg environment like Salmonella enteritidis and mycoplasmas can truly be transmitted vertically. Apparent vertical transmission of these and other bacteria could occur through contamination of the eggshell and by contamination of the hatchery environment, including its personnel, equipment and means of transport. Although statistical associations are not a proof of causality, Studies like the 2016 Norwegian study by Mo and all, Mo et al. are illustrative of the role that breeder flocks can play in the spread of resistant bacteria. They showed that broiler flocks originating from more than two breeder flocks had a six times higher probability of carrying E. coli strains resistance to cephalosporin. The hatchery itself has also, has also been shown to, to, to play an accelerating effect on promoting the spread of resistant bacteria in the case when in ovo application of antibiotics are applied. In the study of Baron, ceftiofur resulted in a threefold increased chance of offspring flocks carrying resistant E. coli. With so many different possible transmission routes, why would we worry about antibiotic use in breeders? What is the logic behind antibiotic-free breeder operations beyond our common motivation to demonstrate that the higher farming standards applied in breeder operations should allow for antibiotic-free production of hatching eggs? Now, each breeder flock carrying above average level of multi-resistant bacteria can, through the various vertical, semi-vertical, and horizontal transmission routes constitute a source of resistance genes over a significant amount of time, a period which is much longer than the cycle of the hatchery and the broiler phase. And even when applying perfect internal and external biosecurity on broiler farms, including thorough cleaning and disinfection, with every new flock, tail chicks are introduced, and with them, bacteria are introduced that can, as we have seen, spread effectively, leading to their early establishment as part of the flock's microbiome. So the objective here is to limit the proportion of resistant bacteria within. A 
Unfortunately, the complex biology of antimicrobial resistance does not yet allow us to estimate the contribution of different sources and transmission routes. Bacteria can carry and exchange mobile genetic elements, often referred to as plasmids, which in turn can carry a multitude of resistance genes, here illustrated in the colored blocks. The co-location of different genes on a single plasmid can result in co-resistance, which means that the application of a non-critical antibiotic could favor the proliferation of resistance to antibiotics that are defined as critically important. So, so how do we quantify antimicrobial resistance today? Worldwide, the most recognized method involves the culturing and in vitro antimicrobial susceptibility testing of indicator bacteria like E. coli, which are commensals presence in the gut of all animals and humans. So when a particular antimicrobial resistance gene or group of related genes is being targeted, like for example with emerging mobilized cholestine resistance genes, then the gene or genes can be directly detected through PCR technology. So how does, what about the future? Now, current technologies do not yet enable epidemiologists to quantify the relative contribution of different sources, nor do they allow us to quantify the level of resistance towards critically important antibiotics in our production animals. Therefore, this is still a, a, a theoretical key performance indicator of the future. Now, direct transmission routes, we've seen that direct transmission routes contribute to the spread of antimicrobial, diff sorry, different transmission routes, they contribute to the spread of antimicrobial resistance. And certain common practices, like the mixing of progeny from different breeders and preventive antibiotic treatments, are promoting transmission. And because of the complexity of AMR biology, it's very difficult to determine the contribution of each factor on AMR prevalence in broilers and eventually broiler meat. What does this mean for our current approach? A multi-hurdle approach throughout the production chain is required. Firstly, to limit selective pressure by reduced antibiotic use and secondly, to limit transmission of resistance genes. So implementing best practices like biosecurity measures and proper cleaning and disinfection between production cycles is critical. With these practices established, single age farming is another critical factor to break the transmission cycle. So the use of additive that enhance the microbiome's ability to exclude resistance bacteria can be an additional strategy but the strongest impact lies in the prevention of disease symptoms, both in parent stock and progeny, as that directly impacts selective pressure through antibiotic use. And with these words, I would like to hand over to Heike, who will give the next presentation and talk about the use of vaccines in disease prevention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Antoine, for those insights. And, and now we go to the presentation of uh, Dr. Heike Bidmore. So, thank you, Tuan, for detailing to us the roots of mechanisms around transmission and antimicrobial resistance. I would like to pick up indeed your last point the, of the multi-hurdle approach in the production chain, which was disease prevention in parent stock and offspring, which clearly leads us to vaccination. Um, before we start, I would just like to quickly go over the topics I would like to cover today. A quick refresh on the vaccination principle then a quick word on commercial and autogenous vaccines, 
And then we will dwell on how vaccines contribute to combating AMR with a practical example. Then of course the advantages and limitations and the points that I would like you to remember. So it goes without saying that both antibiotics and vaccines are established tools to improve health and productivity of livestock. But while clearly antibiotics are a therapeutic measure to treat an infection, vaccination is a prophylactic measure to avoid infection. And this is achieved by immunity through vaccination. So with the emerging um, focus on AMR, the focus on infection of prevention through vaccination is certainly also increasing. We can consider vaccination as a safe training camp for the immune system. So the vaccine antigen is presented to the body and the host induces a suitable antibody response in which then in case of a field infection will provide an adequate defense to get rid of this challenge. We of course differentiate between an actively acquired immunity from vaccination, for example, and a passive immunity by transferring maternally derived antibodies to the progeny and confer protection in the first weeks of life. So for commercial vaccines, we know that the development is long and a costly process. So understandably, new products will target major issues of global interest, requiring high volumes and which are ideally needed for a long time so that the return of investment is secured. Once the vaccine is developed, tested and registered, its antigen composition does not tend to change over time. So we see product cycles of 20 to 30 years, which are not uncommon. So we have a relatively long time to market with long product life cycles. Pathogens, on the other hand, will strive to evade destruction and change their appearance or possibly mutate. Question is, whether such variants are still fully covered by commercial vaccines. And I think we know the answer sometimes yes, sometimes no. When looking at autogenous vaccines, it is essential to understand that autogenous vaccines are custom made vaccines from a specific pathogen isolated from a bird or a flock with a specific problem. This isolate is made into a vaccine and administered to that flock or epidemiologically related birds. So upon receipt of a sample, it is propagated, identified, characterized, and after selecting the most suitable strain, it is used in production for formulating a vaccine. So if we look at lead times, as you can see from here, lead times for production are fairly short. And in fact, we are talking about weeks. For initial strain isolation and preparation the first time, we need to allow some extra two weeks for bacterial strains. For viral isolates, production of master seed may take a couple of months because there is far more testing required. Its use is permitted where commercial vaccines for this indication are either not registered, not in stock or not effective. Its use is subject to veterinary prescription and must not interfere with existing legislation, for example, vaccination prohibition or where ongoing control and er eradication programs are running. This is also clear. So in effect, lack of registered commercial vaccines applies mostly to pathogens that have a limited commercial potential, 
high variability like many zero types or subtypes, numerous virulence factors of uncertain importance to disease and high mutation rates. So we are talking about E. coli, Pastorella, Erysipelas, Staph aureus, but also viruses such as adeno and rheovirus or ORT in Turkey, for example. This, if you look, is actually very well reflected in our top five um, pathogens that we produce in autogenous vaccines for poultry here. And actually a very similar picture you can see for the swine products that we manufacture as well. So we understand that for autogenous vaccines, the lead times are short. Problems in single flocks or epidemiological units can be targeted. The antigen composition is wide and can be updated from batch to batch if needed. And in summary, when we compare autogenous to commercial vaccines, there is obviously more flexibility and agility in the autogenous vaccine process. The strategy of the pathogens to evade destruction is clearly better targeted with autogenous vaccines as we can react very swiftly to such changes. And this is actually precisely the idea of the autogenous vaccine concept. So here is a schematic overview of Lipsig and SIBA to demonstrate mechanisms of vaccination that contribute to reducing the prevalence of AMR. It has been modified and adapted to reflect the situation in the poultry industry. And we will now populate this scheme step by step. So in our example, a chicken has been vaccinated against Pastorella multocida. So firstly, and ideally, the potentially resistant pathogen here, our Pastorella, meets a fully immunized bird. The immediate and suitable immune response will prevent the pathogen from infecting the bird and causing disease, here, foul cholera. So in that case, we clearly stop infection before it really starts. So then obviously where there is no infectious disease, there is no need for antibiotic treatment. Where there is no need for antibiotic treatment, there is no forming of new resistances. In other words, it reduces opportunities to select resistant variants a from the targeted pathogen, here again Pastorella, but B also um, in neighboring species in normal commensal flora, which appear to be also susceptible to this antibiotic. So for example, an E. coli. So vaccination reduces the selection for resistant strains. As for the pathogen itself, the resistant pattern of the Pastorella does not change and it cannot be worse from the beginning than at from the end. So there is no change really to the resistance pattern of the Pastorella itself that remains unchanged and can't worsen. Now looking at the entire flock and flocks in adjacent houses, each of these mechanisms can be amplified by the indirect effect in that vaccination will reduce, sorry, will reduce or actually completely stop transmission of the pathogen. And as we heard before, the potential AMRs with it to other birds. So herd immunity reduces the infection pressure to both vaccinated and non-vaccinated populations. At the same time, it again reduces selection for AMR in normal commensal flora species, such as our E. coli mentioned earlier. Moreover, elimination of a pathogen by vaccination may reduce the need for administering a broad spectrum antibiotic treatment. Why is that? Immunity should 
cover the pathogen species irrespective of potential specific AMRs that may have developed and could be resistant to a narrow spectrum antibiotic. In case where vaccination causes a sterile immunity, that is to say where the pathogen cannot even colonize the bird, I think this was postulated uh, to be considered for vaccination against avian influenza many, many years ago. The reduced density of pop microbial populations by vaccination can theoretically reduce the opportunities for genetic exchange of resistance elements. Now we come to the last and most interesting aspect where the vaccine indeed may specifically be effective against resistant strains and thus counteracting selection for resistance. Here, as you can imagine, is the most perfect space for an autogenous vaccine, as it indeed might be likely that it isolated strains in that flock were only present and found as they eluded antimicrobial treatment. So in this field report that I mentioned earlier was published by Matthias Tote in 2018, an integration with 3 million broiler breeders in Germany faced bacterial infections at onset of lay. On average, 3 million antibiotic treatments per year were administered. In 2016, they introduced an autogenous vaccine with three pathogens containing E. coli, Pastorella multocida, and Gallibacterium anatis, in addition to the standard vaccination scheme, which remained unchanged. Here you can see the number of birds treated per year from 2006 to 2016. The result is pretty self-explanatory. Vaccination decreased the average treatment from 3 million to 1.1 million per year in the year 2016. The main advantages of an autogenous vaccine is certainly that it is readily available to address a very specific problem, even in a very small flock. Secondly, its use is solely under veterinary responsibility, who actually is the best person to judge the problem and the needs of the flock under his supervision. A limitation is certainly the fact that autogenous vaccines are inactivated vaccines, so they need to be injected to each bird. And of course, the autogenous principle is somewhat restrictive on broader use. The specific vaccine may be used, as I said before, in the flock concerned or those that are shown to have an epidemiological link to that unit. And last but not least, isolate selection is very critical to success and therefore perhaps an advantage and a disadvantage or a limitation. So what to remember about autogenous vaccines? Firstly, they are inactivated bacterial and viral vaccines under veterinary prescription. They are tailor-made compositions concerning antigens, adjuvants, and injection volumes to allow flock-specific prevention. And they offer a fast solution as an alternative where standard vaccines do not fit. So finally, the three points to remember how vaccination contributes to combating emergence of AMR. The positive effect on vaccination and immunity on the AMR cascade is Fewer infections mean less antibiotic use and less development of selection for resistant strains. And this applies both to the targeted pathogen population, but also to susceptible neighboring commensal bacteria. So unlike antibiotics, bacteria are not known to develop resistances to vaccines. 
And lastly, vaccines are equally effective in AMR resistant strains or those without. So thank you very much. This is what I wanted to share with you. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Heike, for this insightful presentation. And, uh, and now we are going to open a question and answer section uh, in uh, this webinar. And uh, we have uh, some questions that can be commonly addressed. Afterwards, we will look at the questions from our uh, Q&A panel. So the first question goes to Dr. Tuan. Dr. Tuan, is there scientific evidence of vertical transmission of resistant E. coli bacteria like ESBL, for example, resistant bacteria? Um, a lot of research went into that and it has been shown hard to conclusively demonstrate through vertical transmission for, for these um, commensal bacteria. Um, some researchers failed to detect the resistant bacteria in and on hatching eggs. Um, others have demonstrated the, app, the presence, but um, there are, um, let's say, studies where genetically similar or very closely related resistance E. coli have been found in broilers and they're supplying breeder flocks or in um, day old chicks that were delivered from, uh, from, uh, from foreign uh, suppliers. So uh, it is just a very difficult thing to, uh, to exclude and uh, to research. Uh, mostly, I think, related with the very low prevalence within flock that you might face here. Um, so uh, circumstantial evidence, yes. Uh, repeated conclusive evidence, not at this point. Understandable. Thank you, Tuan. So now we have a question uh, for Dr. Heike. And the first question for you is uh, about disease prevention through vaccination. Mm -hmm. Would disease prevention through vaccination possibly or potentially reduce the occurrence of resistant and multi-resistant bacteria? Mm -hmm. um, there is no real scientific data on that, and maybe we should actually look into this in the future. But as you can imagine, flocks that are receiving autogenous vaccines, um, they might have been treated with antibiotics before. So due to the selective pressure of the antibiotic, which we can assume or not exclude, it is actually likely that the remaining population of the pathogen isolated from the flock and used for production of the autogenous vaccine has higher carriage of ARGs than the strains that initially caused the disease before the antibiotic treatment started. But as I say, this is more logical science than scientific evidence. Thank you as well. So we can understand that uh, there are still some things that uh, need to, to be investigated and uh, we need more research on that area. Hmm. But uh, let's go for another question to Dr. Tuan. And uh, this one uh, is um, about um, susceptibility tests for uh, antimicrobial resistance. So Tuan, instead of culturing a bacteria and running a susceptibility test in the lab, so the best practice that we know today, can resistance be detected through new molecular techniques? What insights can you give us on that? Yeah, it would be great if that would be possible uh, today. I think there is a, there is a positive involve, uh, development there happening, but, but multiple gene can jointly code for in vitro resistance to an antibiotics. They're even not necessarily uh, uh, present on plasmids. They can also be part of the actual host genome, the bacterial genome. And um, uh, so a single gene might only decrease the susceptibility of that bacteria uh, to uh, an antibiotic and not provoke um, full resistance. So you could see it as an incremental increase in the, in the MIC value. So 
typically the more AR gene uh, antimicrobial resistance genes that are present related with a particular class of antibiotics, the more, uh, the higher the MIC value would be. And at a certain cutoff point, we would then call the bacteria resistant. Uh, there are examples where a single um, single uh, gene can already cause resistance. Uh, a, a, a very well-known example is with cholestine resistance, where the mobile cholestine resistance genes can, on their own, um, let's say, uh, uh, cause in vivo uh, resistance to, to the, this particular antibiotics. And that's, of course, um, uh, that, that has been uh, a big concern because this cholestine an old fashioned antibiotic, but they have become highly critically important for, uh, for some life-saving uh, life in, in, in human beings. So, it, so it's not, we're not there yet, but that technology will, 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 will increase to become relevant. Uh, but I think we, know, we have, do not have the full picture yet on, um, on the genes and then also Gene expression is the other thing. Are they really getting expressed to really cause the, the resistance to be there? So it's, it's rather complex. Thank you very much uh, for that answer. Now we go uh, for a question about autogenous vaccines to Dr. Heike. So uh, we know that viral infections can pave the path for secondary bacterial infections as well, which then prompt the use of antibiotics. So why don't we see more autogenous vaccines for viral diseases? Yes, that's a very good question. Thank you very much. And that's very true. There are two reasons actually. Um, one is that if you look into the portfolio of commercial vaccines, there are mostly, or I would say the majority is of viral nature and composition because <clears throat> excuse me, because bacterial diseases you could actually treat with an antibiotic, viral, vaccine, viral disease is not. And the second thing is, of course, from a practical point of view, that viruses are far more difficult to be isolated and propagated. You know, unlike bacteria, I'm not saying that is easy all the time, but I'm saying that they will grow readily um, on suitable media or plates. Viruses need suitable host systems, cell, cells to replicate in. They don't have their own um, life cycle. So it means that viral vaccines are produced on so-called host systems like SPF eggs or embryonated chicken eggs for low pass AI, for example, or on primary chicken cell lines, which are used for Rio and adenoviruses. It's more complex and more difficult and takes also a bit more time. So our um, portfolio is limited to that, but you are right in your statement that there are fewer. Thank you very much for your answer. Now we go uh, with another question to Twan. And uh, uh, you mentioned the use of health supporting products to prevent antimicrobial resistance. Uh, I assume that you are referring to methods to avoid, for example, colonization with bacteria that are resistant to particular antibiotics. Could you explain a, a little bit more on that approach? Yeah, so in, in, the, in the last years, research conducted in um, Wageningen University has shown that early life application of competitive exclusion products can, can prevent horizontal transmission of ESBL coding E. coli. So the, the product used in, in these studies um, contained unselected and fermented intestinal bacteria derived from SPF chickens. Um, so it such application resembles the, the natural situation where, where dale chicks grow up in proximity to their mother and uh, allowing natural translocation or transplant of the healthy mother's microbiome to the chick. So on the contrary, in the same studies, symbiotics were also evaluated. So and containing pre and probiotic components 
And unfortunately, they could not prevent the uh, horizontal transmission. And this indicates that there are still some challenges to overcome in terms of producing effective commercial solutions, at least for this important purpose of uh, uh, preventing the colonization of resistant bacteria. Thank you very much for your answer. And we go immediately to another question about autogenous vaccines. So Dr. Heike, why are autogenous vaccines only inactivated formulations? Uh, yes, um, that is because they are inactivated per definition and per legal requirement. This is regulated in the 2019-6 EC regulation on veterinary medicinal products. So that's the one reason. The other reason is if you imagine that you have a live pathogen, they need to be safe for use in the bird. So what is normally done for commercial vaccines, you have to modify them, you have to attenuate them. And this was historically achieved by running passages in eggs, for example. And we are all familiar with the IB strain H120 and H52 which have 120 passages or 52 passages in their development to be at the appropriate um, attenuation for the level and age when they are used. So as you will see, this is not a realistic option for um, a fast solution when you have a problem on your farm and you want to actually treat the next flock with that. It would just take too long and um, then you are already going into the area of a commercial vaccine. Thank you very much. Um, I see that uh, this uh, topic has uh, uh, a lot of uh, questions and requests in our Q&A section. We will go with one more question for Tuan and one more for you before uh, we go to the questions that we have uh, from the participants. So the question uh, to Dr. Tuan, what is the influence of humans in antimicrobial resistance transmission to production animals and vice versa. Uh, can antimicrobial resistant genes existing in a population be traced and their origin determined actually? The difficulty lies in, in um, really proving the origin and the direction of the transmission, but there are a few examples where resistance genes were analyzed and correlations between their existence in different species, including humans, was actually determined. So surely the direction of the transmission should always be assumed from the context. A, a clear example is when slaughterhouse personnel is seen to carry more antimicrobial resistance genes than the general human population. It is then highly likely that the poultry is the source of transmission and thereby the direction of transmission is, is kind of clear. Um, this is when comparing antimicrobial resistance in the human living in, a, in villages in close proximity to poultry farms and comparing these genes with the genes and levels of genes in the actual farms, it becomes much more complicated to understand what is what type of transmission is happening. These people could have been exposed through chicken or chicken meat via um, different routes, other routes. So uh, um, yeah, it, but to study this, you really require a true one health approach with multiple disciplines working collaboratively using the same analytical techniques and bringing the data together. Um, so far, there are not many uh, large-scale studies conducted to, to address this. In one of our first EW Nutrition webinars, I presented results of one such study. So I invite people to go back to the recordings. And that was one on ESBL conducted in the Netherlands over the course of a four-year period. So, so um, that's an interesting example. Um, of only few that I'm familiar with. Thank you very much. And uh, I think uh, the invitation is also very important. Please uh, check our uh, previous webinars for uh, more interesting topics. So one last question to Dr. Heike. 
uh, before we go to the Q&A from the participants. What happens uh, then to the strains that uh, you receive and how often should uh, compositions uh, be updated in autogenous vaccine production? Mm -hmm. Yes, the strains that we receive, they are identified, they are labeled and they get a, a storage ID number in our deep freezer. We have many, many isolates in there, so we can find them back in case they need to be reused for vaccine production. And the other part was how often to change, right? Yeah, so so the, there is no rule to that at all. We have customers and cases where they have been using their mycoplasma synovia isolate for a couple of years already and it still works and in other cases we have campylobacter uh, strains that are sometimes changed from the first batch to the to the next batch there is a very high uh, changing rate in there so there is no uh, rule to it and it's really down to the uh, the subscribing vet and also in this case we are happy to assist in order to define which strains should be kept or which strains should be exchanged against a newer isolate or a different isolate. Thank you very much. Now I will ask um, uh, both panelists to pick uh, some questions uh, from the Q&A uh, section. Uh, Twine, will you start? Yes, yes, there was a technical glitch here at my end. I think you had the same, um, but I can start. Um, one, one, one question here that I would like to uh, answer is, uh, how can we choose autogenous vaccines that select against AMR bacteria in a population? Now, it would start with the obvious process that is applicable for every autogenous vaccine, and Heike, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it would be to isolate these bacteria that are actually responsible for the disease that you're trying to prevent, and then type them. You want to know what kind of vaccine you're producing, and definitely the producer of the autogenous vaccine will, will want to know. Eh? Uh, now, you would sample multiple animals in a flock, uh, because with many of these uh, opportunistic bacteria, there can be multiple or could be multiple mul multiple chains, strains in play within a flock even. Now then to type them, and that's the expertise of companies like Vaxinova, they can, uh, they can help you to type these uh, uh, strains. Uh, one way of typing is also to look at their antimicrobial resistance pattern with standard uh, susceptibility testing. So in the case when you have experienced in your operation problems with antibiotic treatment related with presumably uh, uh, antibiotic resistance or not presumably maybe even um, demonstrated in the lab, then you could decide to choose specifically these uh, strains, these isolates, and use them as these strains to produce the autogenous vaccine. That, that's the old concept. It's not very different from general autogenous vaccine production, I would say, but just deliberately choosing those strains within that show to be resistant so that you are more likely to protect also against these same strains. Dr. Heike, I see uh, that uh, you marked uh, one of the questions. Yes. Um, this is from, do we say the name? I'm sorry. It's an, are autogenous vaccines more tissue reactive in comparison with licensed inactivated vaccines? I would say no. The, the thing quite often is that um, if you have a very high protein content or very high antigen um, uh, uh, concentration in your formulation and you pair that with an, the normal oil in water paraffin adjuvant, this is always likely to cause a serious tissue reaction. So we offer different um, anti adjuvants as uh, formulation 
in the in the vaccines. So depending on if there is a high uh, salmonella content or a lot of E. coli or something like that in there, we would always speak to the the vet in charge and then discuss together which of the adjuvants that we have would be the most suitable because sometimes it's not only a scientific question but also a question of costs. Thank you. Very I much. hope that answered the question. Oh, I can, uh, sorry, I just had a second thought. Um, what we do recommend is actually that before you use the entire batch in a whole flock, we always um, provide a safety bottle in addition to the batch where the, the farm can, can try the vaccine on a number of birds which are marked or identified or kept separate um, to see and observe them for a week or two and then see how their health status is. And for some countries, we even need the results back from the farmer or from the integration to finally release the batch. Thank you for that incomplete answer, Dr. Heike. Now, Dr. Tuan would like to answer a question. Is uh, there any contradiction of autogenous vaccine with other vaccines like uh, for viral diseases? Tuan. So I would say the general answer to be no, because um, they can, it, these are inactivated vaccines and they will take up a bit of the capacity of the immune system to provoke the, uh, the, the immune response, but um, it is absolutely not a problem to combine autogenous vaccines. Of course, you know, sometimes when, when the number of vaccines become uh, multiple, it is a, it's more of a stress on the animal. And uh, uh, if you start there, I've heard, that, you know, there's a couple, many examples where more than up to four injections are done in, in, in a bird at the same time. And it's not that the immune system can't cope with that, but it's more uh, that the actual injection and application of the product uh, in different muscles at the same time and the handling that is associated with this, that that is more of a stressor, but there is no um, contradiction as such of combining uh, autogenous vaccines with other licensed or yeah or other vaccines in general can i add one word twan if you don't mind combining we don't mean putting them together into but, one bottle yes or needle <laughs> or needle but to have it uh, injected at separate locations potentially at the same time yes yeah good, good addition <laughs> clarification now, I would like uh, to give you a quick reminder here. We are due to end this webinar very soon. We will stick a few more minutes because I see that there are many interesting questions uh, from the audience. Uh, one of them, uh, Dr. Heike would like to answer. It's actually a question uh, that is uh, made in Spanish. Oh, but uh, I think uh, in, in this case, it was probably already partially answered, uh, right, uh, Dr. Heike? <laughs> Can you just read it again in English, please? Yes, of course. Uh, is it possible uh, to put together two um, uh, different bacteria like Avibacterium and uh, Gallibacterium, uh, for example, for uh, infectious uh, coryza? Yes, yes, coryza, yeah. yeah yes, coryza. yes, you are right. It was partially answered already. Um, we can add quite a lot of antigens together in an autogenous vaccine. And we have a certain volume available in the watery phase where we can put the adjuvant in. So it is of course clear that the more you add, that at the end of the day, the, the, the amount of antigen that you have per isolate or per strain will be compromised at some point. Yeah, for pig vaccines, sow vaccines, they have two milliliters of volume. You can pack quite a lot in there, as you will see. For poultry with the normal 0.5 or 0.3, there is limited space, but it is still um, quite uh, vast what can be put in there. And yes, it can be combined. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Heike. We will uh, then answer one last question uh, from uh, Dr. Tan. Mm, 
maybe we are having a glitch here. Sorry, I was oh, muted. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm wondering which one to pick as the final one because um, uh, they're all very much oriented towards Heike. So um, uh, I'm also very okay with our guest speaker to take the last, the very last question, Heike. You're muted too. Um, there, there, there is one question that I think is relevant. Is, is it possible to prepare viral autogenous vaccines? And um, uh, that is, I think, a, an, an interesting question for you to answer uh, as the closing question. Thank you very much, Tuan. Um, yes, we can produce viral vaccines. That is not a problem. The problem, as I stated a bit earlier, is actually to get hold of the virus and to find in which um, host system it will propagate the nicest and the best so that you get a high yield for production and also the preparation of the master seed for viruses needs more testing than for bacteria. So it is very possible. Obviously, we are again targeting those viruses that are variable, that have a lot of variants, that are not covered by commercial vaccines. And, and this is basically, as, as I mentioned, the case for Rio, which has quite some uh, subtypes that don't appear to be well enough covered. So people use the standard commercial vaccines and then add on um, an autogenous vaccine with one or two or three of their own real virus isolates that they have. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like uh, to thank both the panelists for the question and answer section. And uh, of course, for the great presentations. I know that there are still questions unanswered in the Q&A box. I apologize for not being able to deal with all of them during this session. However, we are more than happy to pick up our conversation via email if you write to our webinar at ewnutrition.com email. All questions will be routed to the panelists. Also, the recording of this webinar will be made available in our web website during the coming days. Thanks to all of uh, our uh, panelists for the insightful presentations. And thanks to you very especially for attending and for your questions. Stay safe, keep up the good work and bye for now. Until the next time. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Goodbye. Thank you.